I'm Allison Brown, president of League of Women Voters Falls Church. And on behalf of League of Women Voters Arlington and League of Women Voters Falls Church, I want to welcome you all. We are very lucky today to have a great presentation lined up about the redistricting process. We are recording this presentation. If you're watching the recording, keep in mind that we um, recorded this um, on September 23rd. So things are, things are changing really quickly. We're really in the midst of a fast moving process. So the information you're gonna hear tonight is current as of today, um, but of course you'll need to check the news for updates. So um, League of Women Voters, um, of course, has been very involved in the push for a, a better redistricting process for years. And today we have two of our very knowledgeable experts to uh, talk with us and they'll be able to answer your questions as well. So we have Chris DeRosa and she is the co-chair of League of Women Voter Virginia uh, Redistricting Committee. So she's been leading the charge and getting um, League members all over the state involved and educated and advocating um, for a better redistricting process. And she's a member of League of Women Voters Arlington. And we also have Sarah Fitzgerald. Sarah is an author and a journalist, and she has been a senior <coughs> advocate for a fair redistricting process for several years. And she's a member of League of Women Voters Falls Church. So I am going to turn um, this program over to Chris and Sarah, and um, you will all learn a lot this evening. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Allison. And uh, let me see if I can share my screen. You never know how it's going to work. <laughs> So thank you to all of you for uh, joining us. And let me reduce this so I can see what I'm doing. Um, so I am Chris and I'm with the Arlington League. Sarah has is with the Falls Church League and we've been working um, very closely in recent months uh, as the Observer Corps for League of Women Voters. We're watching every meeting and Sarah is terrific at posting a blog. I don't know how she does it, usually within a couple of hours. So we're going to give you an a overview of what's going on and what we can expect. And we're going to take you to a, on a tour of the website because uh, it's not the most easily navigated website you will ever see, but there's important stuff in there for you. Um, so we know that we have a commission. It's bipartisan. It's balanced uh, citizens and legislators. Uh, and it's led by two amazing women citizens. Uh, Ms. Babichenko and Ms. Harris. We've been very impressed with how they are managing um, the craziness that sometimes comes about. Uh, so we have eight citizens, eight legislators. Uh, Mr. Gilliam uh, from Bristol resigned um, maybe a week, a month ago. He was replaced by Virginia Trost Thornton on the commission. Senator Newman just resigned a little over two weeks ago and he's been replaced by Senator um, Stanley, Bill Stanley. <clears throat> so they've been meeting a lot, um, more so in recent weeks. Uh, the commission has hired two legal teams, one Democratic, one a Republican. They've hired two map drawers who have created uh, draft maps and are revising it as we speak. And they've also uh, hired a communications teams, two, two people or two firms to try and uh, increase the outreach. So just to review quickly the process, right now everything is with the commission. Um, they will send their maps to the General Assembly for an up or down vote. Uh, if the General Assembly says no, then it goes back to the commission for a second try at drawing maps. They'll send it to the General Assembly again. If the General Assembly says yes, then we have our maps. If they say no for the second time, then it goes to the Supreme Court of Virginia, and two special masters or experts will be um, selected or hired to draw the maps at that point. So we're not sure exactly where this is going. Uh, so timelines have been changing. Uh, you know, the census data was delayed. Uh, it was finally released to the states on August 12th. Uh, because it was in a less user-friendly format, it took two weeks to upload that data into the database. They might've actually done it in 12 days instead of two weeks. But based on that information, the commission decided to use August 26th as their start date when the clock starts ticking, because that's the date when the census data was available to the commission. 
So based on the timelines established by the Constitutional Amendment, <clears throat> they have 45 days to submit their first set of legislative maps to the General Assembly. So that would be October 10th. And this is a little complicated and I don't have all the dates here because things changed, but they received the data. They have to send the House and Senate maps to General Assembly on October 10th. The General Assembly has 15 days in which to vote. So that would be October 25th. If they say no, it goes back to the commission and they can set, send a second set of maps to General Assembly. That'll be sometime in November. In the meantime, the congressional maps will be sent to the General Assembly. Uh, they have 60 days for that. So it's um, October 25th is that deadline. Uh, again, 15 days to vote on the maps. That would bring us to November 9th. And you can see that this is right in the middle, not only of early voting, but the general election and post general election. So we don't know how long this process will last and when we'll actually have maps and what happens after the election. So there are a lot of pluses um, to this process from the way it was done in the past. Uh, we brought map drawing into the sunlight. There's been full transparency. Um, all the meetings have been open to the public, whether in person or uh, virtually. And we think that's terrific. Um, other positive things, the commission decided to start fresh on the maps. In other words, they did not start with current maps and just tweak lines to try and come up with new districts. So we thought that was um, great. Also great was incumbent address addresses have not been used so far when drawing the maps. But I think that information is going to be used maybe this week and this weekend when we see the next set of maps. So I think one of the results, when I saw this, I think this was in the Virginia Mercury. Uh, this compares the, on the right, the green map shows the first set of districts for Northern Virginia that were, were drawn by one of the map makers and compare that on the, to the one on the left in brown, which are the current districts for the Senate in Northern Virginia. And just by looking at it visually, you can see how much uh, prettier they are. And I know prettiness is not supposed to be one of the criteria, but they're much more compact and they make a lot of sense. So we're hoping to see that with all the rest. So now we want to take you to the commission website and that's virginiaredistricting.org. So let me see if this works. Okay, do you see the commission page now? Looks like it. Okay, good. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work. So this is what uh, commission page looks like. So I'm gonna take you kind of a walkabout um, if you click on about, you can see the na names of the legislators, excuse me, and their email addresses. You can go to <coughs> FAQs, which the communications team has <coughs> revised recently. I haven't read it all myself. Uh, legal authority, public participation guidelines, the rules for how to behave, basically. <clears throat> on the homepage. So one thing you wanna look at, meetings and public hearings, we'll go there first. And you can see on the left, all the meetings have been listed. <clears throat> Today's meeting, there was an agenda posted. <clears throat> the materials that they were gonna look at will be posted here too. Um, and there's usually a button here for live stream. And the live streaming is usually using the Senate Granicus, um, live stream tool. And um, for past meetings, you can see that the videos of uh, the recordings of the meetings have been posted. So you can always go there to, if you have nothing better to do and you wanna just <laughs> listen and watch, you can do that. Okay, and on the right um, are the hearings. So we had one set of public hearings before they started drawing the maps. And now we see that there are public hearings posted with regional emphasis uh, for the first week of October. So we'll talk more about that later. Oh, public hearing FAQs and regional map. That's new. I hadn't seen that before. So you have to keep checking back because they don't tell you when something new is posted, but it might be there. 
What, what okay. quick comment, Chris, is because of the, the communications and outreach effort got off to a really late start. Very late. They're, they're actually late working on improving the website so we could demonstrate it tonight and it may look different tomorrow. <laughs> it might. Because uh, even from this afternoon, it looks different. They're like the, the regional emphasis on the public hearings. Okay, so the next thing that we might want to look at um, those meetings, you can look at criteria, etc. So there are a couple ways that you can um, submit information. So we'll look at that. Um, if you want to look, if you send an email to varedist at dls.virginia.gov, you can also CC all 16 commissioners. Um, those uh, submissions have been filed here as one long PDF of nearly 600 pages. Um, so some are short, <clears throat> some are longer. This one's got lots of words to read. So that's you know what's been um, posted via email. There is also a comment form here. Um, this is fairly simple to use. It was even simpler a couple of days ago. Uh, but they've, they're asking for more information now. So this is uh, basically a Google form. You put in your information, including your locality. Um, these are the regions they're generally talking about when they talk about regional hearings, et cetera. So you mark that and indicate if you're speaking as an individual or for, you can see the categories there. And eventually, I, and I don't know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't know what all of these are. Um, if you're commenting a map. Um, Those are probably the draft maps at the time the form uh, was built. Yeah. Actually so, out of the seat. So uh, this yeah, was yeah. designed, I, I, not to interrupt, but to, uh, oh, go ahead. to provide uh, more sortable categories. Um, and it was created by the communications consultants. They're feeding it into a tool so that if say a Northern Virginia legislator wants to read a report on all the, all the comments filed related to Northern Virginia, it does a database sort and they could, and again, with the topics of interest that Chris is now on, you could, you could um, kind of give an, in, a sense of what your comment is about. And it's, it's a sort of crude way, frankly, to um, try to organize comments so that commissioners can, you know, find either what's the degree of interest in a topic or zero in more on the comments that might be of particular interest. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so you can kind of take a look at all of that. Um, the communications team apparently has sorted a lot of the comments that were submitted already and have given those to the commissioners. We have not seen them. Um, and we think they might be available to the public in that sorted format, but we honestly don't know. Okay, so now we're gonna look at participate. Um, I'll show you one thing here. We've talked about community of interest before. A few of you may have done your community of interest using the representable tool or districter. Um, this is one that you can do on the website itself. It's different. You're basically going to um, draw polygons. So I'll show you one that I submitted. Mine was North Arlington. And I think mine is this one here, but it's overlapped with lots of others. Let's see if I can take away some of these. Um, and then I wrote a, a short description of what I was talking about. And there are some for other areas of the state. So if you wanted to do that, let's see, go back here. Oh, just very quick, add a community of interest. It says, click on the map. So you're gonna click where you wanna start drawing your community. So let's say I click here in Virginia Square and that see how it has lines. So you basically would click up it and draw your polygon however you want it. Um, I found it difficult to use, but we could do that. And then it would give you a, a form like this to put in your information as well as your comment here or your description. Okay, so that's, if you wanted to do that, you can. Okay, 
one of the ones Chris drew, I think, was Halls Hill, uh, the historically African American neighborhood off of um, Lee Highway, and yeah. which in the past had been split up um, into districts. Well, currently it's split up. Except what I mean, in the past, yeah. the old district, the current districts, but making the case of why that was a bad place to make a split. Yeah. Um, part of Halls Hill is actually in my precinct when I was precinct captain, so that's how I know about it. Okay, now the, probably the most interesting part that you will want to look at is view 2021 plans and comment. So we're going to go there. And what they've done, which just in the last couple of days, they split it into House, Congressional, and Senate. Now, Congressional, they, the map drawers have not drawn any maps for Congressional districts, 11 of them. But I see here that several people have submitted their own plans for congressional districts. So you can open them and you can download them and you can comment on them. So let's look at Senate. Um, and again, there's lots of different things here. So once here's a citizen submitted plan, here's another one. The ones that you wanna look at in terms of the commission plans are labeled A3 and B3. Okay, those are the most recent. By Monday, there could be an A4 and a B4 if they um, twiddle with it. These ones with lower numbers, A1, A2, B1, B2, are the ones they drew earlier, several weeks ago, and those do not include the entire state. So you can look at them, but um, what you really want to look at are these. So we're going to take a look at A3's um, Senate districts. I'm going to they're open now, it. I'm just going to say they're now loading them with the most recent maps on top. So if you look <clears> for the, the commission map that's on top is the most recent one. And it looks like those citizen maps have come in uh, more recently. Yeah, so we may see more. OK, so this is what it brings you to. I'm going to hide the legends for now. Um, down here, you can see they give you some demographic data, how many um, uh, what's the population in each group here? Uh, the deviation, they're allowed to have a 2% deviation um, from the ideal population per district. The Constitution and Code actually says you can have a 5% deviation, but the Commission wanted to keep make it narrower. Um, so that's what those are, and they've the map drawers have done that. So I'm going yes, to- Chris, I just to add on that point that I think they've realized, um, and I think the map makers have been gently telling them that if they had a little more flexibility, there are some places where a whole county comes very close to an equal number of districts. And so if they were allowed to have a little more flexibility, mm -hmm. be able to uh, uh, keep jurisdictions um, intact rather than having to go look for a couple of precincts here or there to tack on to right, populations. Right. Okay, so after hiding ledges, I'm gonna click on this because I wanna like zoom in without all this other stuff. So that brings us just to the map and we will, you can zoom in and look at whatever part of the state you want to. So there's the Southwest. You can see that their districts are larger. These are Senate districts again, um, because the population there is less dense. So they have to pull in a larger geographic area. Um, and we'll take a look at some of these dots that you see, the green, yellow, and red dots. But since we're all from Northern Virginia, we're gonna zoom in there. And you can see the outlines of counties. So pretty much the map drawers have done an excellent job, I think, of keeping cities together as much as possible. And whenever possible, trying to keep counties together and not splitting them in several different directions. So I think that's very commendable. Um, and hopefully they will continue that. So here we can see B, this is the B map drawer. And B I, is referring to the Democratic uh, map drawer. A is the Republican map drawer. And I think one thing that's good is that when you're looking at a map, you can't automatically tell if it's been drawn by a Republican or a Democratic map drawer. So I think that that's good in terms of being nonpartisan uh, as much as possible. So I'll zoom in a little bit more. So Arlington currently shares three senators, state senators with 
either Fairfax County or Alexandria City. So you can see that Arlington alone, based on our population, comprises almost an entire Senate district. So we have one Senate district that's only Arlington. And then there are some precincts here that had to be combined somewhere with another uh, jurisdiction. So here it's been combined with Alexandria City, which is kept intact, as well as beyond Alexandria down towards Mount Vernon in Fairfax County. Falls Church, you can see here, is included uh, with Fairfax County in, a, in Senate District number three. Also notice that the numbers are totally different from what we're used to. Um, and that's because the map drawers just started in Northern Virginia because there was no racially polarized voting concerns. So they could just go ahead and start. And so they just started numbering districts, one, two, three, et cetera. Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna get out of there because I wanna make a comment. Let's see if I can. Okay, there it is. I wanna get back to that original. All right, so I wanna add a comment. And so when you click on add comment, it says click on the map. So let's say I want to add a comment here because this is about where I live. And then I can say dislike, like, or I just wanna write an opinion, fill in your information, type in your comments. You can attach something if you wish, and then you click add comment. Anytime you submit a comment, what they're doing now is you will get an email that asks you to click on it just to confirm that you are a real person and that's a real email address, okay? And within very, very quickly, you'll see it show up here. Um, oh, the other thing I didn't show you is, so if we click, you can see, oh, I guess I can't click in this mode, okay. So if I click on this green dot, it'll bring up my comment. And the green means I liked something about the map. And then you can see that I talked about having one senator instead of having three, one plus a little bit more instead of having three. Um, so there aren't many comments you can see here in our area, but there are other areas where people have made comments. The red would be something they don't like. The yellow is just a comment, okay? I noted um, they did, they did some work on Northern Virginia first, and when they unveiled the statewide maps um, last earlier this week, I guess it was back on Monday, we lose track of, of these dates, um, they incorporated the whole state, but they said at that point that they had not gone back and redone Northern Virginia. So you would probably find more comments on those earlier uh, versions of Northern Virginia. I posted comment there. And uh, one reason, I mean, potential consideration for people who live in Falls Church, uh, in, in all of the maps, Falls Church is small enough that they've kept it in the same district. But there's been a difference whether it's connected to Arlington or whether it's connected uh, to Fairfax County. And because we share services with both counties, you know, there's arguments for, for either one. Um, so, but if you have a strong opinion of where you think your orientation is, you know, feel free to, to go in and mm -hmm. comment or anything else you might want to talk about. And these numbers on the side are the numbers that I think were in that other list. And I, I don't know what the logic is be behind the numbering. Okay, the one we looked at was A3. That was actually the Republican map drawer. So B3, we'll take a quick look. <clears throat> And you can see if uh, there's a little bit of a difference. Senate map's not, not too different. So Falls Church is still uh, with Fairfax County. We can see a no here. Um, I think this person was opposed to using Shreve Road, if anybody knows Matthew Savage, as a boundary between the two districts here. Um, he suggests using Leesburg Pike instead. Okay. Um, and down here, again, Alexandria is kept together, combined with part of Fairfax County and part of Arlington. So similar. There was, uh, by the way, some public comments uh, a week or so ago about people 
who expressed concern they wanted to keep the Columbia Pike corridor together, I think between Arlington and Fair, particularly as the community um, that has a lot of uh, Hispanic people in it. And um, it was interesting. I think that something that will be taken into consideration as you go forward. And so again, I didn't, I guess I didn't mention this. So Arlington is here and, um, you know, Arlington has three senators and the west part of Arlington, which is where I live, is represented by Senator Howell. Her district goes all the way into Fairfax County. Barbara Favola represents the eastern part of Arlington County. Her district goes into McLean through Fairfax County and even into Loudoun County. So it's a very long, elongated district uh, with only a few precincts in Loudoun. So you can he see here that Loudoun is not gonna be combined with Arlington. And I think Loudoun will be happy about that. Um, so, you know, that's one of the- Can you change over to the house map for a yep. second? Yep, I wanna go to the house. So let's go to the house. And again, these are the older ones. So we're gonna look at A3 and B3 and Chase Tuck has submitted his own plan. So we'll look at A3. And here is where you're gonna see that Falls Church City is combined with Arlington on one of the maps. I don't remember which one and Fairfax in the other map. So there's a hundred districts. So you can, and you can see there's a huge cluster of red dots here. This is Charlottesville and Albemarle County. And I guess Albemarle has been split. So people there have been very unhappy about that. I read some of their comments. And there are a few comments down here. There weren't any down here at all earlier. So people are starting to notice. Well, the okay. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I think it's more, as you've shown, the rural areas with smaller population, and if you're trying to follow county boundaries, there are fewer issues than you're going to have in a, a more densely populated area. Mm -hmm. where there are lots of different ways if these <clears throat> could be drawn, particularly, you know, if you need to subdivide a county. All right. So you can see here Falls Church is uh, grouped with part of Fairfax County, Pimmett Hills, out into Merrifield and just beyond, um, and Idlewood. Is this the, this might be the beltway, I'm not sure what this dividing line is here. Arlington, on the other hand, <clears throat> instead of four delegates, we're gonna have three, which makes sense population wise. <clears throat> so we're not gonna have someone, um, so you can see Alexandria City is, has two delegates entirely to itself one here, district one, the gray district and two, which is green. So, except I guess they have a little bit of Fairfax County, Huntington attached to the green district. So Arlington will not be sharing a delegate with Alexandria, but there's one delegate who will be sharing some district, some precincts uh, in the Bailey's Crossroads area on this map, at least Fairfax County. Um, this is kind of a weird, I don't know why this was drawn this way. Now, some people have said it's it's a we they should do it more horizontally, that they felt they may have thought oh, we should follow the Potomac, but the argument is made, and I think it's a valid one, that the issues of South Arlington um, and with the Amazon development and all that are very different now, and that they have a different focus than those um, North Arlington areas, you know, which are often oriented towards McLean and also mm -hmm. there was some thought that if you were going to divide Arlington, you should really do it in, in places east to west. And so what Sarah mentioned earlier too, this is Columbia Pike. And those of you who know Arlington know that that's a vibrant area. Um, and this part, a lot of people said should be really combined with South Arlington because they share, you know, the other side of um, Columbia Pike is not really a different community of interest. Um, so there are a lot of people that are, I think, going to comment on whether Route 50, which is here, should be the divining line instead. And that would make more sense in terms of traffic, because you're not going to cross Route 50 to go to the other side um, on foot. That's not your, really your community. You'd have to drive there. 
Okay, so that's um, one set of house maps. Let's look at the other. So that was A3, I believe. So let's look at B3. And this is the one where I think Fair Falls Church City is going to be combined with <clears throat> Arlington. So all you Falls Church City residents may, as Sarah said, have strong feelings one way or the other. So you may wanna comment. So there are three no's here already for that area. And if we wanna look at those, let's see this one. Oh, this is Sarah's. And she mentioned yeah, I think that. I, I think I'm, I mean, I, it's really a neutral comment, but I, I think okay. I thought the opinion was a choice. <laughs> and she mentions that, you know, she you can make arguments for putting Falls Church City with either Arlington or Fairfax County, but she likes the other one. So, and then she uh, explains that a little bit more. And she also mentions Columbia Pike. So I don't remember who this is. This is right in the corner of Falls Church. Oh, this is Candy Butler, one of our league members in Fairfax. Um, she asked, what's the rationale for including this figure in district's finger in district six? I think that, see this little part here? And it might be, uh, from what I understand, sometimes block, census blocks or even cities have little fingers. Manassas City, or I think is the one that has the airport included and has this weird little finger sticking out. So I don't that know where may actually is. not have any population in it. It looks kind of like where the tall office buildings are at seven. Yeah, I think this is this is um seven. This is 50. So this is seven corners and these are just roads, I think. So I'm not sure exactly what the answer is there. Some, sometimes a finger can actually turn out to be pretty benign. Yeah. So here's another kind of it's strange the way you can see there's pink here, which belongs there. And then this green is combined with West Arlington, West Falls Church or something. Let's see. What one, one issue for people in Falls Church um, is the development of the area around West Falls Church, which is obviously going to have a surge of population in the next decade, which is not yet reported in the census. Uh, mm -hmm you know, figures. And so I'm not so this sure. This is Matthew, can... Matthew Savage again. And he says here, pairing the city of Falls Church with Arlington still, still makes absolutely no sense to me. It ignores joint history of our community. And this will divide the greater Falls Church community into three separate districts, denying us effective representation in the General Assembly. So, you know, those are some examples of the kinds of comments you can make if you'd like to. But certainly, um, especially in the house, since the Falls Church City is, is um, grouped differently in the two sets of maps, and Arlington has some strange um, district lines, uh, take a look and make a comment if you like. So yeah, it was I interesting, the, um, uh, Mackenzie Babichenko, who is the Republican co-chair, and she lives in Hanover County, and and she dug right in and said, you know, you've divided, I live in a planned community and you've drawn the line right through the community and it would put the elementary school in one Senate district and the upper schools um, in a different district. And it, it was obviously, you know, a benign, you know, inadvertent mistake. And I think they'll adjust it, but it's a kind of fine detail that if, you know, people don't speak up, they often don't realize what they've done because they're just, moving little census blocks and precincts. <clears throat> so anyway, that's kind of a tour of the, of the website. Um, hopefully it makes a little bit more sense to you. Um, our main uh, message I think is that we do need to speak up. This is our once in a decade opportunity to say what we want to see in the maps, um, tell them what we like, what we don't, what they, we don't like. Uh, once the maps are drawn and passed, that's it. We will be stuck with those maps for the next 10 years. So you can write. We showed you different ways of doing that. You can speak at any of the meetings or at the, one of the public hearings. They usually have a sign up um, and they'll send you a Zoom link. Um, there's usually a deadline to sign up to speak. Uh, we got them to change it from 24 hours before the meeting to maybe three hours before. So that's an improvement. Uh, but look for those links uh, in the meetings list. 
You can draw a map if you want to, committee of interest using a tool, statewide map. You saw some people did that. Um, here's the email address. If you want to use it, it's on their website, V-A-R-E-D-I-S-T at dls.virginia.gov. You can put a comment in their, on their website, comment on the maps. Remember, A3 and B3 is what you want to look at. Don't be surprised if it becomes A4, B4, or who knows what next week. Um, and you can choose to speak at a meeting or a hearing. So we know the hearings are gonna be the first week of October. Remember the maps are due to the General Assembly October 10th. So this is right before the maps go. Um, doesn't leave them much time to change anything based on the public hearings. Today, they announced that we thought this was gonna be statewide, they're virtual, but they decided to um, divide it using the eight regions and putting an emphasis. So October 4th at 10 a.m. will be hopefully people from the Southwest. Um, at 4 p.m. it'll be Northern Virginia. So that's gonna be us. And then the morning of October 5th, which is a Tuesday afternoon, and you can see the dates there. Um, I don't think it's a hard and fast rule. If you can't make one day, but you can make another day, I would sign up for that. Also, we had hoped, we had asked that they have at least a couple meetings outside of work hours, but they have not changed that yet. So that's another comment I'm gonna make again using the general portal. If you think that's important, you can submit that idea too. Like, what about all the working people? And so the, Website is virginiaredistricting.org. Um, some of our partners, we can get lots more information. One Virginia, of course, has lots of information on their website. And VPAP, uh, Virginia Public Access Project, I think that's the correct name, um, has lots of graphics and they do a lot of analysis of maps. So it's a great site. Don't forget to go to our website. Uh, we'll show you in a minute what that looks like. And we have a redistricting Facebook page. So you can join that. Um, and we try to post up-to-date uh, information there if you're on Facebook. And another thing, if you have not signed up for Outreach Circle, this is kind of a, a communications tool and it's outreachcircle.com backslash SWX266 is assigned to the League of Women Voters of Virginia. So we use that to, uh, we've started using that to post timely information and might be a call to action. Um, here's a page, it, you'll basically get an email and uh, you can look at it and find out more. So this one, the League of Women Voters um, sent one out and it says that next, the 30th, whatever day of the week that is, I think it's Thursday, they're doing something um, on local redistricting and you can RSVP here. So again, we'd love to have you sign up. The league is gonna use it for more than just redistricting. It's gonna be, you'll see a lot more, I think during the legislative session when that starts. So I'm Chris, you can reach me, chris.lwv.222 at gmail. Sarah is sarahfitz at aol.com. And so I think that's it. Oh, I'll stop that. So Chris and Sarah, thank you for that. Um, I know Allison had to jump to another League of Women Voters uh, program, but uh, I wanted to see if there are any questions from anybody who's online. Yep. I don't see any in the chat. Oh. <laughs> um, one, one point I was going to make in addition to what uh, Chris made, and she mentioned um, the VPAP site. And uh, VPAP does a lot of interesting analysis. And it's one of the things that is um, interesting to me is that the commission has tried as much as possible to, to keep incumbent addresses out of the debate so far, out of consideration. They, there is a sense that eventually they will have to look at that in part to analyze whether the maps um, are considered fair uh, and, and equitably, you know, based on the partisan split in the state and trying to figure out how the districts would currently perform. There's also a sense that you don't want to end up have the map makers accidentally uh, pairing 
making two incumbents run against each other in the same primary. So there is some um, thought that if they start to look at incumbent addresses, um, they could make some shifts so that it's not that you want to protect incumbents, but you also, there's a thought they don't want to unnecessarily penalize them, um, you know, sort of accidentally. But one thing a, a tool VPAP has done, which you might find interesting, is uh, one of the things they've created is that you can type in your address and it tells you uh, based on at least the latest, the, the last two statewide proposals, I think, uh, whether your current legislator would be your legislator going forward under the redrawn maps. And, you know, sometimes uh, <laughs> there's a sense of people saying, I hate gerrymandering, but I like my, my, my legislator, you know, and, and so people, um, might be disappointed to learn that if the maps withdrawn, they could, you know, redrawn, they could lose, you know, him or her, depending on how they end up. But that will tell you, uh, you know, who, who you might look forward to, or rather you might, you might not have your current one. Um, the, um, you know, the other thing is that because of this analysis done by VPAP and other people, because, you know, there are public databases that have, addresses, uh, people are already looking at uh, some of these things and, and some of the legislators have said, you know, there's lots of people talking about this, so we might as well, you know, start talking about it ourselves. And in particular, some people are look up survey or so much for that. Maybe they're putting in a new map or something. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They, uh, you know, there's oh, yeah. some people are starting to look at this uh, with an eye to uh, demographic changes and how they might affect uh, persons of color who are incumbents. I think they discovered that there's a couple of districts in the state, one in the city of Richmond, and I think because of actually probably more white people moving in uh, to Richmond or Richmond becoming more diverse, that the district would no longer be a majority uh, minority. Uh, and they're talking about uh, whether they're going to try to draw where they could something that they call uh, coalition minority districts. And I think this is a factor in a place, say, like Arlington or Fairfax, where you have several different um, minority communities that if you put them together, actually become a majority. And then the other thing that they may be looking at is what they call minority opportunity communities, where a minority group uh, represents 30 to 40 percent of a district and so they have a pretty good chance of uh, controlling the district even if they're not in an absolute majority. So they've had some tensions in recent meetings about and unfortunately the Voting Rights Act, the federal level has been uh, you know undermined a little bit by recent Supreme Court um, decisions. We still have a pretty strong uh, Voting Rights Act in Virginia that they fall back on in, in continuing to assert the importance of these kinds of considerations. Um, Greta Harris, the African-American co-chair, Chris alluded to, we've been really pleased with the leadership the women have provided and have worked together and, um, you know, just really good management of, of stress and male legislators and things. And uh, Greta Harris gave a, a pretty emotional speech today about growing up in Virginia and her parents who were upstanding citizens couldn't vote until 1965. And, you know, she, she made a disparaging reference to what was going on in Texas and, and Georgia, and we don't want that going on here. And, and so it was kind of interesting, actually. There is a question in the chat asking if you can review the timeline for implementation of the new districts. Well, they realized, let me take that, Chris, or go ahead. Go ahead. Well, they realized early on um, that they would not be able to draw the districts in time for this year's election. Um, still to be determined is how soon we have another uh, House of Delegates race, and it's still a question that's unresolved, whether they would wait two years, uh, which is when the, the Senate districts, the new Senate districts would first be contested or whether somebody 
uh, pushes to force another election with the new um, House of Delegate districts uh, next year. Uh, and the congressional districts uh, would be done in time uh, for the 2022 elections. And I think there might be one lawsuit um, trying to force the issue of having a election again for House delegates in 2022. I don't know what the status of that is, um, which also brings up there was a lawsuit about prison gerrymandering. Someone filed, I think it was Senator Hack Hackworth, is that his name? From Southwest he, he, Virginia. He's a brand new senator who was uh, appointed to replace, I think, someone who had stepped down. So, no, someone who passed away. Um, oh, excuse me. Yeah. I can't remember his name. Anyone remember? He'll the man down later. In Southwest who died of COVID, a led, red Republican legislator, I think, in the Valley or, or down. His sister is actually a Supreme Court justice for Virginia. Um, Anyway, there, was, a, there is, was another lawsuit about prison gerrymandering, and uh, the suit was filed by um, legislators who realized that because of the number of prisons that they have in their districts, those prisoners, a large number of them would actually be counted for redistricting purposes in their home counties or districts. And so those Southwest counties or other counties, mostly rural, would lose a lot of pop population, sometimes thousands. Um, but that suit, I understand, um, uh, did not go through. It either was thrown out or dismissed. Um, and the league just put out a press release. I haven't read it yet. It went out today, I think. I don't know if Joan knows more <laughs> about it than I do. Yeah, so. it was not heard by the Supreme Court. Okay. So they will not be allowed to use the prisoners to beef up their population, which was the old way of doing it. As you know, uh, incarcerated people cannot vote in Virginia, but still they were being, they were, their bodies, if you will, were being used to beef up those areas in which they are imprisoned, even though they're not allowed to vote. So that is not going to happen. That was a huge victory. Actually, uh, George Barker today, um, who, who knows a lot about, he, he drew the Senate districts in the last round, and he has kind of in some ways used his knowledge of redistricting to try to take charge. But today he uh, made a reference saying that Senator Louise Lucas, uh, African-American member down in the Portsmouth area, that apparently there's several prisons in her district, and that so she might be uh, someone who would lose uh, some citizens uh, because of this law that, that they passed uh, last year, and that that might uh, change the minority majority aspect of her district as well. And uh, Joan put in the chat a link to um, a, the league is co-sponsoring this with the National Black nonpartisan redistricting organization and one Virginia. And it's gonna be a look at Virgi the VPAP, um, their, their site and their help, what analysis they've done. Um, it, so if you're available, is it next, the 29th, is that right? Yes, yeah, the 29th uh, at 7 p.m. Okay, uh, that should be really interesting. I'm gonna hopefully be free and I can watch that because I've looked around at VPAP, but I don't understand everything. So if you wanna, get a real deep dive into their analyses, uh, suggest that you join them. I get the, by the way, uh, I've followed the VPAP news summary, um, which is very good for following developments in Virginia, particularly now um, when I don't think the Washington Post is covering state and local things as closely as they did back under the Graham's ownership. and. What it is basically is a, is a news summary uh, from around the state and is organized by topics. So it, it's interesting to go in and read what like other papers in other parts of the state, what their opinion pages are saying about redistricting or you know just issues that are developing in other parts of the state that might be of interest um, you know, because of the things you're interested in. So 
either we've answered all questions or we bored you to death, but any other questions? <laughs> you can tell we've become really geeks about this. It's kind of scary sometimes. Um, I, I, I just think I should do a shout out to Chris. She did a nice shout out to me and that um, Chris chaired our committee when we were working to get the constitutional amendment passed and she agreed to stay on this year. And I think it's fair to say, Chris, that uh, we didn't anticipate it would go on as long as it has because we didn't fully understand the impact of the census data delay. And by the same token, I've, I've recognized that the people who volunteered uh, <coughs> serve on the commission, I think a lot of them did not know what they were getting into. And even if they had, it had gone on and been much more demanding. And, and one thing, you know, if you, if, you, if you ever run into them and a couple of of um, the Northern Virginia people, I think you may see around Northern Virginia politics in the coming years. Um, you know, when they, one of the good news, bad news things is when July 1st came around and the pandemic restrictions uh, were lifted, it meant that under the constitution or whatever Virginia code, they could no longer hold virtual meetings. And so for the commission to have a, formal meeting and take votes, it has to have a quorum of both legislators and citizens. And I think it's what Chris designed. You have to have six of each, I think, to have a quorum, which means that starting in July, um, you know, these people had to drive to Richmond to participate. And I think we think it was possibly a factor in the decision of the man from Bristol uh, to resign that he had not anticipated it was you know, going to have that kind of demands you know, both on his time and being on the road and all of that. Yeah, so, so we've been, you know, yeah, Chris, Chris is also, also along with Fran Larkins, our other co-chair who is in Fredericksburg. They have been good at going down to Richmond for a couple of in-person hearings and raising the flag. We've been pleased that the commission has shifted back to facilitating um, online comments, virtual comments, comments even, even when it was holding an in-person and so that has made it easier for all of us to participate, um, you know, if we want. So, but she devotes an awful lot of uh, work to it. And I think bristled the other day when one of the commission, you know, citizen commissioners suggested that we were only hearing from just a few activists and you know, part of <laughs> you held a meeting at you know nighttime, you might hear from a few more uh, other than all of us gray haired people. Yeah, three of the commissioners have been known to say that it's all, we're only hearing from a few rabid, they didn't use the word rabid, but you know, geeks and nerds um, don't pay attention to them. They've actually said that, that it's not important. So that, you know, infuriates us, of course. And part of it is they never hired the communications team back in February when they should have. And the one that they finally did hire I'm sorry, I'm not real pleased with how slowly they're doing things. I don't know how to do a website, but I, I think I could have done more than they have done. Um, they're not reaching out to people to let them know about this. So that's why they're not hearing from many, but it'd be really great if each of you could send one comment in or make one comment on a map, they'll see that yes, people do care and uh, they might start paying more attention. If they see Sarah's name or mine, I think they sometimes, shove it aside, put a big X on it, like Joan does all the time with my emails. Oh, really. no, no, not true, not true, not true. <laughs> but really, really, don't be afraid to just, you know, put in a comment. I think it's really important. I do think that all the comments they got about the need to start from scratch, that that really helped carry the day. And I think citizen members could fall back on that and and they won that vote and you know it was kind of a big um you know turning point and i think it took a while for the citizens to get up to speed and to get confident and be willing to push back a little bit with the legislators who had done it before um but that's not happening the way it did in the in the first months the other, the other thing that's a little problematic in terms of public hearings for Northern Virginia is they made a decision early on to adopt a, uh, a regional approach to Virginia that is followed by the uh, 
Weldon Cooper Center for Public Policy. And it makes Northern Virginia a fairly big area uh, that extends, I think, down to Fredericksburg and out mm -hmm. to London. And so when you look at the volume of comments, uh, Northern Virginia is, um, you know, far ahead of everybody else. And, you know, the hint like down in Southwest, you know, they'd be lucky. I think of the, when they got the 600 comments, they had like three from Southwest and six from Southside and, you know, uh, twice as many from Northern Virginia as anywhere else. And so we kind of grit our teeth every time we declare a public hearing because, you know, we think we're gonna be there for hours and maybe when the final rhyme comes around, it'll last even longer than the first, but. Well, I know we're almost at the at the hour. I want to say thank you to Sarah and Chris and Joan and actually most of you on on this call for your leadership on this. This is so critically important. And uh, while there might have been a lot of Northern Virginia comments, I will take Chris's um, call to action. And now that I actually know how to get on the website and actually maneuver the website, and it's not as not as scary as I when I first pulled it up on my own, I will absolutely put in a comment and I encourage everyone to. But I just want to say thank you for this because um, this is critically important and, and you made it seem so easy. So I don't know if anyone has any last comments, but with that, um, if not, I will turn off the recording and I'll let uh, Sarah get back to not having her entire day on Zoom. <laughs> I put in my email. So, you know, if you have any questions, because I've already had questions, like even after going through the demo, they go on the website. It's like, what am I supposed to do again? So, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll try and help you out and tell all your friends. And if you know of another group who wants to walk through it quickly, you know, I'll be happy to to help out. One other thing, there's they're supposed to soon implement a pop up and, and it's in there somewhere on the commission's website that you can uh, get emails of like changes or new announced hearings. And it's one thing that we all do to keep. So if you really wanna follow this closely in the next couple of weeks, that's something to consider doing. Although they don't send out very many emails. <laughs> so don't, it's not critical. Chris and I send out more to each other, so. <laughs> By the way, uh, for, you, for those of you in Paul's church, um, if you know Marcus Simon, Delegate Simon, you know, he, strongly opposed this amendment, strongly opposed it. Um, but he is on the commission and he is really working hard to try and make this work in a fair manner. Um, so if you know him or if you see him, you know, thank him for, for what he's doing because he really is trying to stick up for the citizens, I think, and for fairness. And the citizens and yeah. commissioners are so important to have there. Um, the politicians, especially Senator Barker and Senator Newman, who are senior, really try to control the process. And the citizens, especially the two co-chair, have fought, have resisted. They've put up their walls. And it really is looking you know, much better for Virginia than the politicians having control. So thank you for your votes. If you voted for the amendment last year, it's not perfect, but it definitely is better than I think what happened before. Chris, Chris can I underscore one more point? Because I think there's a bit of misinformation. <laughs> see, we can keep on talking. You can keep see on that talking. Happens. I'm sorry, one more thing. Now, now that we're not being recorded <laughs> anymore. No, just I, the people who are still, you know, worried 